This video is brought to you by Broken Anvil and their new campaign, Forged, live right now on Kickstarter. All right, friends, let's see what's on the list for today. I wonder what topic I should pick. Oh, wait, what's this? How convenient, that's exactly what I was looking for. What's up people? My name is Liam and welcome to the Millennial Model Mayhem Content Zone. Ever since I made the Gamma Wolves Battle Report, I've been wanting to make a video about tabletop gaming in general, because it's one of the main reasons that I got into painting models in the first place, and despite saying in that video, I'm a more of a painter than a gamer, people. The process of making that battle report really reinforced how intrinsically linked both the painting and the gaming sides of the hobby are for me. If you're unclear what tabletop gaming is... Tabletop games or tabletops are games that are normally played on a table or other flat surface, such as board games, card games, dice games, miniature war games, or tablet games. I tend to gravitate towards science fiction and fantasy miniature war games, in case you couldn't tell from the chaotic arrangement behind me. With that being said, please relax and allow me to regale you the tale of my personal gaming journey, which games I enjoy the most, and why I think they're important. The prologue to my involvement with tabletop gaming started with the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game from Games Workshop. The Peter Jackson movies had an enormous impact on my tastes, so I was ecstatic when a friend showed me the corresponding miniatures game and it didn't take long for me to save up to buy the Two Towers boxed set. Unfortunately, my collection has been lost to the sands of time, but at least exploring this game, which is now called the Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, led me on to discover Games Workshop's flagship products, Warhammer Fantasy and 40,000. During this early period, I was also being influenced by the world of scale modeling by my grandfather and uncle, who were both into building model aircraft. Around this time in my life, the gaming was just an activity that I shared with a small group of friends, and eventually my teenage brain did get distracted by other things like playing the guitar, or being in high school drama, or even anime. Despite all this, my soul was still stained by the ink of many a sci-fi and fantasy author, and I still had a dedicated spot for the miniatures on my shelf. Before I move on to the next chapter and explain how I became a true GAMER, I need to take some time to talk about the massive impact that Warhammer Fantasy and 40k has had on me. Name a more influential text from the early 2000s. I'll wait. When you start to collect, build, and paint an army of miniatures, regardless of whether you play the game or not, and even if you copy the colors on the box art, that army will become uniquely yours. Then, once you combine that fact with the rich, grimdark fantasy and sci-fi settings of Warhammer, you've got quite a large sandbox to play around in. In terms of actually playing the games, I mostly played Warhammer Fantasy with my Lizardmen and Empire armies, and I tried a little bit of 40k with a small Tau force. However, it's ultimately not about the games for me, because the worlds of Warhammer are what truly got me hooked. Most of the positive experiences I've carried forward with me came from being engrossed in the fictional settings and of course sharing the experiences with friends. Games Workshop is arguably the biggest producer of miniature war games, so there's already been plenty said about everything from the rules, business practices, and lore from other talented creators. It's difficult for me to talk objectively about something with such strong nostalgic attachment, and that doesn't really fit the vibe for this video. But for now, I'll say that getting into Warhammer tabletop games is expensive, so I recommend looking at the used market. And if you're just interested in the fictional settings, there are plenty of excellent video games to play. <laughs> I was there, working at the game store the day Age of Sigmar released. I witnessed the destruction of the old world and the abomination that was that first rule set. If you know, you know. 
Jokes aside, one gripe that I do have is that the old box art was way better. I mean, I guess it makes sense to put a picture of the actual model on the front of the box, but I mean, come on, this just slaps. I hope you understand, box art is a very serious topic that's important to me. Even though I don't play any of the flagship games anymore, they're still very much a part of my life. Whether that's going through any of these fine source books I've collected over the years, working on one of their excellent quality miniatures, or even playing one of their more modern games that I'll talk more about later. Now the game that really ignited the spark of my gamer instinct that made me want to actually get good at the game and be competitive was good old Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering has had just as much if not more impact on the tabletop gaming world than Warhammer. And I'm bringing it up now despite the lack of miniatures because my experience with these trading cards helped develop my current approach to tabletop gaming. I don't like the gambling adjacent aspects of trading card game business models, but I don't have to let that stop me from enjoying the game. I find Magic has excellent rules design and mechanics that can be applied to multiple formats, and deck building involves plenty of creativity and strategy as well. I find the 5 color mana system and the way each color has its own playstyle that also provides logical connections to the flavorful lore and artwork is quite elegant. I've also had some great bonding experiences with friends playing this game, but also plenty of negative experiences when it came to organized play in my local communities. When the friends I started playing with had to move away, I started going to local community events like tournaments and pre-releases, and the rush of victory combined with the potential to win prizes swept me into the competitive hype. I got really burnt out after about a year because I found a lot of the people I ended up playing against were really unfriendly and held a win-at-all-costs attitude. But I totally understand that for some people it really is all about the thrill of competition and winning, and the faster nature of Magic's gameplay provides less incentive to be polite with your opponent. So ultimately I realized competitive play just wasn't for me. I enjoyed building decks that were based off themes and lore that I enjoyed, rather than what was best in the meta, which is an outlook I've carried with me ever since. Building your own deck can be very satisfying, but nowhere near as satisfying as displaying your own fully painted army. So eventually I traded in most of my valuable cards for store credit that I used to buy miniatures. However, as you can see, I still kept plenty of cards for casual play. Highly recommend the EDH format, also known as Commander. As much as I enjoy the artwork and lore of Magic the Gathering, there aren't as many good gaming source books like there are with miniatures games. Although I guess there are some D&D books like this Ravnica one I've got here. Speaking of D&D, it's time to talk about it. It's probably the game that I've spent the most time playing. Before I start though, a word from today's sponsor Broken Anvil and their new campaign Forged, live right now on Kickstarter. Forged is a massive campaign full of high quality, low cost tabletop miniatures and original 5e compatible content for gamers everywhere. Forged includes beautifully sculpted 28mm heroic scale pre-assembled plastic miniatures, as well as 5e compatible content, and there are some really amazing goodies waiting to be unlocked. Backers may choose the Heroes box, which features an exciting array of brave and daring characters. The Encounters box might be more your style, with its squads of formidable enemies and foes. Backers also have the option to get both heroes and enemy squads with the Adventure box. And there's also an Adventure STL bundle for all you DIYers out there so you can 3D print the heroes and enemies at home. But if you want the very best value this campaign has to offer, then pledging for the Forge Masters bundle will get you all the minis in the Adventure Box, plus the 5e Adventure Module, plus the Creature Compendium, plus the 7-piece Dragon Bundle, plus the 45-piece Terrain Bundle. The list goes on. These are Kickstarter exclusive prices, so by supporting this campaign you'll get an incredible deal on Broken Anvil's creations before they hit retail, and you'll be helping the BAM team achieve their dream of making these minis a reality. The campaign is live right now on Kickstarter, you can see it all for yourself by checking out the links in the description below. 
Stranger Things comes out and everyone's like, wow, this looks really fun. And I'm like, I've known this the whole time. Am I right, gamers? Comment below if you wore out a VHS copy of the first live action Dungeons and Dragons movie. It's not good. Watch it if you want to see some janky CGI dragons and Jeremy Irons doing this. As a very nerdy child, I was well aware of Dungeons and Dragons as I was getting into miniatures gaming, and have fond memories of signing out the 3rd edition monster manual from the library to covertly flip through it during school. In my youth I was never quite able to get a campaign going that lasted longer than a few sessions, but I still knew in my gut that this was something I wanted to keep playing alongside my miniatures games. D&D can utilize miniatures after all. As I was making my way out of competitive Magic the Gathering, I eventually got a job working at the friendly local game store where I was able to surround myself with fellow nerds all excited to get into the freshly printed 5th edition of D&D. After getting the hang of playing with a few different characters, I had gained enough confidence watching my various game masters run the adventures that I decided to give it a shot myself. Once I tried running a couple campaigns myself, I could tell that it was my preferred way to play. I can still enjoy playing a single character, but I find the extra challenge of facilitating the experience for everyone and being the game master quite satisfying. I've played a lot of 5th edition D&D, and I don't think it's perfect, but I think it did an amazing job at making the game more accessible for new players. I can see why some people prefer other editions or even different role-playing games entirely, but the thing with D&D and tabletop RPGs is that you can really tailor the experience to the preference of your playgroup. I personally prefer to run my games with an emphasis on character interactions and cinematic moments, but still with enough combat and other encounters to include that sweet, sweet dice rolling. One thing that's a recurring aspect with the games I enjoy, especially with D&D, is the social aspect. I don't think it's a hot take to say that socializing is good for you, whether you're extroverted or not. And having a good role-playing group can be an incredible bonding experience, and forge memories that you look back fondly on for years. The hardest part about D&D is actually organizing a group of people to meet up regularly to play. I'm sorry to say, but all those memes are true. As much as I love RPGs, the hook planted by Warhammer all those years ago was still lodged firmly in my tastes, and I knew deep in my gut that I wanted to get back to miniature wargaming eventually. D&D typically doesn't have the same spectacle of having two different armies of miniatures facing off against each other on the tabletop, and as a role-playing game, the play experience is of course completely different from a miniature war game. War Machine and Hordes from Privateer Press are the tabletop games that I have the most to say about. The two games are essentially the same rule set, and most people refer to it as just War Machine, so I'll be doing the same. I had previously gotten a taste of War Machine when a friend and I each got a Mark I battle box back in high school, but life got in the way so by the time I was able to get back into the game it was on to Mark II. This began a phase where I was going pretty hard on the game and getting a lot of painting done because of the desire to have a fully painted army on the tabletop. I greatly enjoyed the process of constructing army lists because of the similar feel it had to building decks for Magic the Gathering. Combine that with a rule set that was well suited for competitive play and I had a lot to sink my teeth into, in a similar way to how I began playing competitive magic. Thankfully because of my previous revelations with how I enjoyed playing magic, it didn't take long for me to change my mindset to better enjoy War Machine, because in addition to having well written rules, it has a great fictional setting and lore to discover. The way Privateer Press did sourcebook releases for the first two editions of the game had the same appeal as the Warhammer books with plenty of lore, artwork, model showcases, and of course rules. However, the War Machine ones had an ongoing narrative that you could read in small sections from various characters' perspectives, with the main narratives progressing through the expansion books and faction-specific books containing more one-off stories for individual characters. Furthermore, the entire Iron Kingdom setting started out as a supplement for D&D 3rd Edition. 
The Iron Kingdoms eventually became its own standalone RPG, but now it's circled back into becoming a campaign setting for 5th edition D&D. Unfortunately, during my time playing in late Mark II and Mark III, there were some issues both in and out of Privateer Press's control that hindered the growth of the game. There were issues with supply lines and production, some people left the company, some rules were changed for better or worse, competition in the industry increased, and global events just made it pretty difficult to operate a company in general. I agree with some people's criticisms and disagree with others, but overall, most of all, I just want to remain optimistic and think that the game has a future, especially now that Mark IV has been announced and it's in a kind of playtesting stage. I think overall, though, War Machine Mark III ended in a really well-balanced state, and that everyone who worked hard to get the game to where it is today should be proud of their work. Remember when I said, what's my favorite tabletop war game, you ask? Why, it's War Machine and Hordes, of course. About a week after I published that video, Privateer Press made the announcement for Mark IV. Coincidence? Correct. The post-Mark IV announcement discourse has been pretty spicy overall, with trepidation coming from within and without the community. And I think the most talked about aspect so far is the fact that the minis are being produced by 3D printing instead of traditional means. I try and avoid the contentious discussions most of the time because, like with Magic, ultimately at this point I care more about just playing the game for fun with my friends, and of course displaying the armies on the shelves. But with all that being said, I did order the Gen Con sample battle group for Kador, so let's take a look at it. I'm no expert when it comes to 3D printing, but there were some issues with the product when it arrived. Like one of the torsos having uncured resin in some of the deeper cavities, and some thinner pieces breaking in transit from being brittle. Thankfully their help desk sent out replacements promptly when I reached out, but I hope their quality control improves for the proper Mark IV releases. The sculpts look great though, and I'm a massive fan of these pieces being engineered with cavities for magnets, because I had to drill those myself previously. I can also do this fun comparison of the Mark I Kador battle group I painted years ago. These minis are all metal and have quite a satisfying heft to them that I appreciate more and more over time. Speaking of metal minis, shout out to Zimmy for donating this box of nostalgic pewter. I love how much character these sculpts have, so thanks for sending these my way in the wake of Mark IV's announcement. I'm always going to have a soft spot for metal minis, even if it's more difficult to work with and expensive to produce. I recently finished up the remaining models for my Scorn Forces, and personally I feel content with my relationship to the game at this point. If Mark IV works out and is worth playing, that'll be great and I look forward to playing it. And if things take a turn for the worse, I'll just keep playing Mark III. I've got a satisfying collection of Scorn, Signar, and Mercenaries, a shelf full of rich lore to dive into, a head full of fond memories of War Machine, and people I know that I can arrange a game with if I want. How are you finished your Scorn army? Didn't you impulse buy a bunch more when the new edition got announced? Hey now, those, uh, those don't count. They aren't assembled yet. And besides, don't you have a lot of work to do on your Crix army now? That's right. I got Blue Parappa into a miniature war game. There was even some crossover appeal to her work in fiber arts with this Crix Death Ripper plushie. I hope Privateer Press can continue War Machine's legacy into this new era of tabletop gaming that I like to think is a sort of golden age, because there's just a plethora of new and exciting games to dive into. One of which is Conquest, the last argument of kings. While I don't have one game I consider my main focus right now, I've been growing more interested and am consistently impressed by the work Parabellum Wargames is doing with Conquest, Last Argument of Kings. I made a video with the starter set last year that I encourage you to watch if you're interested in the game, and I bring that up because after it released, Parabellum noticed my work and reached out to start an affiliate relationship, and have since sent me more product. Partnership aside, I wouldn't have used my own money to buy the starter set and put in the effort to make that video in the first place if I didn't think the game was worth talking about. 
As I've been working through different generations of their models, I can clearly see the improvements they've been making to the way they're engineered to make the cleanup and assembly easier. And by this point in the video, you can probably guess how excited I was to receive a copy of the Conquest Companion book. I had a great time reading through the lore for this setting. Parabellum didn't need to make a book like this. They have effective ways to deliver the rules and showcase the lore digitally. But they understand the appeal of a good source book and a nicely finished hardcover, and I love to see it. It's clear that a lot of thought has gone into their game, lore, and products. They've also demonstrated that they know how to effectively take feedback, run a healthy community, and update the rules in order to have proper balance. So I'm excited to see where this game is going to go. I'm really hoping in 2023 I can find the time to get more painting done because I only recently finished the units I started in my original video, and I've already ordered more army reinforcements. Whoopsie! You've only painted two units? I don't feel as bad about my backlog anymore. I was a little busy, okay? <laughs> Before I get to talking about the games that I'm most excited about, here are a few honorable mentions. If you want to experience some of that grim, dark sci-fi Warhammer 40,000 action, you can give Kill Team a try and see what it might be like before sinking too much money into an entire army of miniatures. In a similar fashion, Warhammer Underworlds is a good way to experience gaming in the Age of Sigmar fantasy setting, as well as getting your hands on some excellent minis for painting purposes. Infinity is a sci-fi skirmish game with strong cyberpunk and anime aesthetics that I only played a bit of, but if you're looking for a game with good advanced mechanics and tactics to dig into, you'll probably want to consider it. I believe in their newest releases they have a fairly streamlined way to get into the game that doesn't force too many complicated rules on you at the very beginning, and the company Corvus Belly also produces some of the best detailed metal miniatures that I've ever worked with and I've also heard good things about the newer materials they've been using recently. Lastly, while they're not as cool as miniature war games, I still think they can be pretty fun, so I wanted to mention some of my favorite board games, such as Parks, Azul, and Scythe, which includes miniatures. Now onto what I've been saving to talk about last, miniatures agnostic games. If you've been following my work over the last year, you've probably been wondering when I was going to bring up Gamma Wolves, as a good portion of my energy has gone towards customizing Gunpla and making content about it. The game is miniatures agnostic, and encourages use of whatever mecha-like models you see fit. I got into the game specifically as a way to combine my hobbies of tabletop gaming and Gunpla modeling, which has proven to be a great success. In my opinion, the best part about the tabletop gaming landscape right now is the proliferation of these kinds of games over the last few years. If you're unfamiliar with miniatures agnostic games, they're basically rule sets designed to work with whatever minis the player wishes, with usually some restrictions on things like scale or base size. There are a lot of options right now when it comes to tabletop games in terms of mechanics, miniatures, terrain, scale, and budget. Like, before 2020, I played Warhammer 40k Kill Team with some friends, but now we're trying a game called One Page Rules, which offers alternatives to Warhammer 40k Fantasy, Age of Sigmar, and their skirmish-sized equivalents. The basic rules are available for free online, with paid options if you want to expand your gameplay. So far it's been pretty fun, and it feels like the rules bloat that often comes with Warhammer games has been trimmed off for a more streamlined gaming experience. Games like this give you an excuse to pull from different areas of your miniature collection, and to me represent the pinnacle of player freedom. So if you're not feeling the vibe of the big franchise games like Warhammer and War Machine, perhaps look into some miniatures agnostic offerings. I think the most important thing I learned when I was gathering my thoughts for this video was that yes, the introverted creative hobby time aspect of all this is important, but the socializing and human connection aspect that tabletop gaming provides is just as important. So thank you very much for listening to everything I had to say about it, from my gaming journey to my opinions. Hopefully I passed some of my passion along to you, or you at least now have a better understanding of how it all influences my work. 
I consider War Machine, Gamma Wolves, and Dungeons and Dragons to be my favorite games. And then the ones I'm most excited about right now are One Page Rules and Conquest Last Argument of Kings. Obviously, it's okay to not agree with everything I had to say, and I'm interested in hearing what other people's opinions or personal gaming journeys are, so please leave a comment on this video. Now, I know the majority of subscribers to this channel are interested in Gunpla customization content, and rest assured that more of that content is coming. The next video, as a matter of fact. And if you'd like to know exactly what Gunpla that's going to be before anyone else, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash millennialmodelmayhem. Joining will display your name alongside these fine sprinkles and grant you exclusive benefits. And if you want more benefits, you can pledge an even greater level of support and join the Mayhem Machines, Bo and Ryan, or the Gog Hand, Dolfo Janelle and Sukasa WM. Thanks again to Broken Anvil Miniatures for their sponsorship, and I'll see you again next time in the Millennium Model Mayhem Content Zone. The algorithm demands that you lock on notifications and annihilate the like and subscribe buttons. And leave a comment.